From the studios of WAMU in Washington, D.C., I'm Maureen Fiedler, and this is Interfaith Voices. And here's what we've got for you on the show today. How is it that people came to think of Jesus as God? This is one of the most important questions in the history of Western civilization. We'll follow Christianity's long, winding path to calling Jesus divine. Friends, we get a lot of books here at Interfaith Voices, but lately there's been a spate of books about Jesus, more than usual. I've got a stack right in front of me here that we pulled from the office. There's Reza Aslan's book called Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. Then there's a new one by the Jesuit Jim Martin called Jesus, a Pilgrimage. The famous biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan has a new book on the parables of Jesus. And now Bart Ehrman has one called How Jesus Became God, The Exaltation of a Jewish Preacher from Galilee. Bart Ehrman is a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but you may remember him, as I do, as the religious scholar who loves to challenge conventional beliefs with scholarship. And so, welcome back to Interfaith Voices, Bart Ehrman. Thanks for having me. Bart, all these books, why all the scholarly interest in the person of Jesus? Is this just a momentary surge? Well, I think there are two things. One thing is I think that the interest in Jesus does ebb and flow over time, that there just happen to be some moments when discussions of Jesus are very important, and the, those moments may be tied to uh, what's going on in the cultural wars today between the very conservative uh, religious right on the one hand and the neo-atheist movement on the other. I think both sides are highly interested in Jesus for opposite reasons. The other thing is that people realize just how important Jesus is historically. Uh, my, my book isn't about the historical Jesus per se, but about how, uh, how Jesus came to be understood to be none other than God. And I would argue that uh, this is one of the most important questions in the history of Western civilization. That, that may seem like an audacious claim, but here's the deal. If Jesus had not been considered God— his followers would have remained a sect within Judaism. Uh, they would not have converted large numbers of Gentiles because Jesus would have been seen as a Jewish teacher who, who was crucified. If they didn't convert the Gentiles, then there wouldn't be conversions from the time of Jesus' followers up to the 4th century. Uh, so that by the time of Constantine, there wouldn't be millions of Christians in the world, and Constantine himself would not have converted. If Constantine hadn't converted, the Roman Empire would not have converted. If the Roman Empire had not converted, Christianity would not have been the, the major political, economic, social, and religious force throughout the history of Western civilization. We wouldn't have had the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation, uh, the modern world, if Jesus had not been declared God. Yes, and Christians generally today believe that Jesus is God who became man. And many think that this is an unusual, even unique concept in religions around the world. But you make clear in your book, and I find this fascinating, that this was nothing new. There were lots of God slash humans in those first centuries. In fact, the Romans were famous for it. Can you give us a couple examples of what those old Romans did? Right. So uh, this is something that is surprising to a lot of people because uh, today people think that Jesus is the only miracle-working Son of God that, is, uh, that the earth has ever seen. But what I do in my book is I show that both in the Roman world and in the Jewish world, uh, there were uh, lots of people who were thought to be, in some sense, both divine and human at the same time. In the Roman world, one of the gods would become human for a while, uh, and sometimes it was because humans were exalted to the level of divinity. Uh, humans, for example, who were great uh, military or political leaders, such as the, the founder of Rome, Romulus. There are a lot of people like that in the time of Jesus. And you mentioned this is also true of ancient Judaism, and I usually think of Judaism as the quintessential monotheism. Yet you say the, angels and even Moses were sometimes thought to be divine, and there were even gradations in divinity. Some people were more divine than others— 
Now, this isn't that, a Judaism that I've ever heard about. Uh, can you explain? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. It's one of the real surprises for people uh, when when one studies ancient Judaism. Uh, it's it's true that a number of Jews, many Jews, probably most Jews at the time of Jesus, were monotheists. But even as monotheists, they, they certainly believe there's only one God who is the creator of the universe and who is the sovereign and Lord of all. But they thought that there were plenty of other divine beings. Uh, there were angels and archangels and principalities and powers and cherubim and seraphim and all sorts of divine beings. Uh, And there were gradations within these levels of divinity, so much so that uh, sometimes angels could be called gods, and even human beings sometimes were called gods. In the in the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament, the king of Israel sometimes is called God. It doesn't mean that the king was that creator God, but it did mean that the that the king, in some sense, uh, as a son of God, was a was a divinity. And of course, that raises kind of the ultimate question you you bring out in your book: when people call someone divine, what do they mean by that? Well, that's exactly right. Uh, the reason I raise this uh, in the book is because when somebody says Jesus is God, you have to ask, what do you mean by that? In in what sense is he God? And so there were some Jews, for example, who thought that Moses had become a second God. Uh, Well, what did they mean by that? Well, they meant that he had been elevated to a level of divinity because— mainly because of his righteousness, uh, and that he was he was put up on the level with other divine beings, such as angels who could be called God. And so there, throughout the ancient world, not just in Greek and Roman mythology, but also within Judaism, there were gradations of divinity. Let's move on to Jesus. And a fascinating question is, how did Jesus think of himself? Did he ever say anything that would lead scholars to think that he thought of himself as God. Well, certainly in the New Testament he does, uh, but only in one of the Gospels, the Gospel of John, where Jesus makes uh, very uh, bold claims about himself. He says things like, I and the Father are one. He says, before Abraham was, I am, uh, claiming for himself the name of God himself, the, the name I am. Uh, the people listening to him, the Jews listening to him, know full well what he's saying in these cases because they take up stones to stone him to death for committing blasphemy, for calling himself God. Um, The interesting thing is that these self-claims of divinity are found only in the Gospel of John. The earlier Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't have any claims like this uh, coming from Jesus' lips, which makes you think that if if these earlier Gospels knew that Jesus had called himself God, you, surely they would have said something about it. It, it, it would be the most important thing. So uh, it, it doesn't seem likely that they just uh, decided not to mention that part. Uh, my guess is that these earlier Gospels and the earlier sources they're based on simply had no idea that this was something that had happened in Jesus' life, which makes me think it's probably not something that happened in Jesus' life. This is something that goes back to the Gospel of John, but, but not to the historical Jesus. Now let's turn to the early Christian community and how those folks understood Jesus. And you say they came to understand Jesus as divine, but it didn't happen all at once. And the key was the resurrection because it singled Jesus out from other apocalyptic preachers of his day. How did early Christians understand the resurrection? Well, this is the key, I think, to the to the whole question that I'm addressing in the book. Um, if the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are right, that Jesus was preaching about the coming kingdom of God, it's possible that Jesus considered himself to be the king of this coming kingdom and that his disciples agreed with him that he was going to be the future king. Another word for that is the Messiah. He would be the Messiah in this future kingdom. But when Jesus was executed, this would have disabused them of their belief, because rather than establishing the kingdom of God, instead Jesus was squashed by the enemy. And so this must have completely dashed the disciples' hopes. But then some of them came to think that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and that was the beginning of the idea that Jesus himself was divine. The logic was that these disciples had visions of Jesus. They they saw him afterwards, and they concluded that he uh, was no longer dead, but he, he obviously wasn't with them anymore. He was nowhere to be seen. So where is he? He'd been taken up into heaven. And so the disciples came to think that Jesus had been divinized. He had been one of these people who was taken up and made 
divine. And at that point then, as soon as the disciples came to believe in the resurrection, they came to think that Jesus in some sense was God. Some might wonder, if Jesus is God and the God of the Hebrews is also God, how are there not two gods? And if you add the Spirit to that, how are there not three gods? Of course, we got the Trinity out of this, but how was it handled in those early days? Well, that's exactly right. That was the dilemma that uh, the Christians were facing. They wanted to remain monotheists, believing that there's only one God, but they uh, they believed that there was a God the Father, and there was also Christ, and eventually there's the Holy Spirit. So how does that work exactly? And part of my book involves uh, trying to show how they worked all this out before the traditional doctrine of the Trinity became established. One of the views, for example, that was very popular for a long time and was held by the uh, the leadership of the Church of Rome, in other words, the, the, the early popes, was the view that uh, scholars have called modalism. These people who held this view maintained that God existed in three modes, uh, that just as I'm at the same time, uh, I myself am a, a son, and I'm a brother, and I'm a father, but there's only one of me, uh, so too with God. Uh, God was the Father, and God was the Son, and God was the Spirit, all at the same time, but there was only one of him. And so in that view, there's only one God, monotheism, and yet Christ is God as well. Of course, there were a lot of teachings about the divinity of Jesus or the non-divinity of Jesus in those early centuries, and it's not possible to go through them all. But the biggie, if you will, is Arianism. So who was Arius, and what was Arianism? Right. This is a very interesting topic, and it it turns out that many people who know anything about Arius are are given wrong information about it, Uh, even in some of the most uh, popular books written on such topics in recent days. Wrong information is given. What's sometimes said is that Arius believed that Jesus was just a human and that he wasn't divine. That is absolutely wrong. Um, Arius was a priest who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, at the end of the 3rd century, beginning of the 4th century. And he developed a view of Christ which said that uh, Christ was God. Uh, He was God in the sense that in the remote past, eons ago, God created a second divine being. uh, And the second divine being, Christ, is the one who created the universe. So that Christ is God, he, he is, he's a divine being, but he's a secondary God. He's, he's subordinate to God the Father, because you can't have two gods who are equally God, because then you'd be, you wouldn't be a monotheist anymore. And so he maintained that Christ was subordinate to God the Father, as a son is to the Father, uh, and that Christ came into existence at a certain time in the past. So then the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD condemned this as the Arian heresy, and approved what is today called the Nicene Creed, which is still recited by Christians. So what's the historical significance of that development and that creed for Christianity? Well, no, that's exactly right. It was a big moment in Christianity, because Arius' views of Christ being a subordinate divinity uh, were quite controversial, because uh, there were other church leaders who argued that Christ was not some divine being that had been created in the past, but that Christ had always existed with God the Father, and he wasn't subordinate to God the Father. He, in fact, was equal with God the Father. Uh, this was the view that was put forward by uh, Arius's own bishop, a man named Alexander in, in Alexandria, Egypt, and the Council of Nicaea was called in order to solve this problem. Interestingly, it was actually called by the Roman emperor Constantine, who was the first Roman emperor who had become a Christian and was uh, quite concerned that the Christians work out this theological problem, not because Constantine himself was theologically that interested, but he, he was interested in having his newfound faith used as a way of unifying his already fragmented empire. But Christianity was fragmented over this issue uh, raised by Arius. And so Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Uh, there were 318 bishops from around the world who came. They discussed the er- views of Arius and the views of Alexander, his bishop, and they decided for Alexander. 
um, overwhelmingly decided that, in fact, Alexander's views were right, and that then began the movement toward what we think of as the traditional doctrine of the Trinity, in which Father, Son, and Spirit are all equals. What is the Nicene Creed? And I'm wondering if you could even say a couple lines of it for us. The Nicene Creed is a creed that's still confessed in many churches today that goes back to this Council of Nicaea. Um, At Nicaea, when they condemned Arianism, they wrote up a creedal statement, a statement of belief that every Christian was expected to agree to. And this creed is about God and Christ, uh, and just very briefly about the Holy Spirit. And so the Creed says, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and so on. Uh, That's the Creed as it was written at Nicaea, and the Nicene Creed people recite today is is very similar to it. Right, and certainly in any Christian church I've ever been in on a typical Sunday, that's recited by everybody even today. Well, it's it's seen as the bedrock of the Christian faith. Uh, the important thing to recognize is that it took about 300 years for them to come up with this. There were debates about virtually every statement that's now in the Nicene Creed, and this creed is formulated in order to resolve the debates. So, you know, some people may wonder why it starts off by saying we believe in one God. I mean, why would you say that? I mean, I mean, who thinks there are two gods or there are 30 gods? Or I mean, why one God? And it's precisely because there were other Christians who had other views about how many gods there were. And it goes out of its way to emphasize the equality between what would be God the Father and Jesus. That's right. Christ here is said to be God from God, light from light, begotten, not made. It's emphasizing that because Arius thought that Christ had been made at some point in the past and that he wasn't equal with God. And, and this creed affirms that, in fact, Christ the Son is equal with God the Father. And so a historical ear can hear that creed answering those ancient heresies. That's right. I think it's important for Christians who recite this creed to know where it came from so that they understand the nuances of it. It's not simply a, a, you know, something you, you should be saying by rote because that's what you're supposed to say in church. You should be uh, thinking about the theological investments that, that this creed uh, presents. At the end of the book, You share your own personal beliefs about Jesus. I know you had journeyed from being a very serious born-again Christian at one time to being an agnostic today. And I know you don't think of Jesus as God yourself, but you still think of Jesus in many positive ways. I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us your own view of Jesus. Right. You know, I was raised thinking that Jesus was God. And when I had a born-again experience in high school, that was confirmed for me, and I believed that for many years. Um, When I became an agnostic, of course, I I don't believe Jesus is God. I, I don't believe in God. And so I think Jesus was a human being. But I continue to be struck by the profundity and the importance of Jesus' teachings, especially his ethical teachings. Um, Jesus had the clarity of insight to realize that the the entire law uh, of the Jews was summed up in the commandments to love. Uh, for Jesus, that meant to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. But it also meant to love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, as simple as that is, it strikes me as incredibly profound, and that uh, if people were, in fact, to implement the teachings of Jesus, this would be a very good world indeed. Bart Ehrman is the author of a provocative new book called How Jesus Became God, The Exaltation of a Jewish Preacher from Galilee. Thanks again for joining us today, Bart. Thanks for having me. 